So the talk is, uh, I'm really happy to be able to introduce Jeremy Anastasi, who's a philosophy major, an award-winning philosophy major at Castleton University, uh, who served in Iraq. And he's going to share how he's found the teachings of the Stoic philosopher, particularly the warrior Emperor Marcus Aurelius, but several other important Stoic philosophers as well, to be of real profound assistance in assisting himself and other vets in confronting, addressing issues that arise through service, especially combat. So it's a really difficult, as you know, uh, uh, range of issues that arise. How could there be a system of philosophical thought that, that addresses those issues? How can Stoicism practically improve our lives? And that's what he's here to talk about. So. We're proud of his work. Would you join me in welcoming Jeremy, who's going to share some thoughts? All right. We'll stick around for discussion. <clears throat> thank you for that. And thank you all for coming out here. I know some of you drove a long way, and uh, it means a lot to me for y'all to come out here and do this. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a Marine veteran, infantryman. Uh, my unit was 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marine Division. I served in Haditha, Iraq. 2006 into 2007, and uh, Karma, Iraq in 2008. Um, my first deployment was definitely the rougher of the two. Um, by the end of that deployment, more than half of my squad was reemplacements. Um, so there's a big problem that I've noticed, and a lot of you are probably aware, this 22 a day thing. 22 veterans a day kill themselves. Um, my unit, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marine Division, is, is uh, not immune. This past year, there's been several that have killed themselves, and one was even uh, involved in a mass shooting suicide uh, out in California. Um, and so, the more I hear about this, the more funerals we have to attend, the more I want to get out and talk about this sort of thing, and hopefully shed some light on uh, new perspectives. Um, <clears throat> adaptation, when you get home, it can be tough. It was tough for me. I know. Um, it took more than 10 years before I could really even feel like I was in the right place. Um, I mean, I, I wasted a lot of time. Uh, money that should have been spent on my apartment or my car was spent on drugs or, or alcohol. I mean, just gaffing off life and not taking it seriously, not really knowing my direction. So um, I understand that struggle, and part of it is the struggle to find happiness. And that's uh, something that a lot of veterans, I don't think, really contemplate. When I was in, if I had to ask somebody what happiness was to, and to talk to me about it uh, philosophically, I would have probably been told to shut up. Um, there's other things on, on the, uh, a Marine's mind besides happiness. Um, and in terms of coping with what's going on, in the heat of it all, um, you're told to not dwell on it. And uh, I think, extremely contrary to that, I think we should dwell on death. I think we should dwell on our happiness. These are things that uh, we're basically living towards. We want to be happy, and we're all going to die. So we can't avoid these things. It's, a, it's, a, it's right in the front line, just like a, a soldier. Um, Aristotle coined the term eudaimonia, uh, which means well-being. And that's the first time we really see in history the word happiness. Um, and he, like I said, he described that as well-being. But the way to get there would have been the right actions that lead to happiness. So he developed a system of, of ethics, virtues. Um, I believe, like the Buddhists, that the right view is how you gain the right actions. So, like I said, I want to try to put some perspective in to veterans. Um, why should we focus on philosophy as veterans? Um, a lot of uh, a lot of philosophers were were veterans. Um, and many people who were in the military were influenced by veterans, and I'll just name a few. Like Socrates was a, gr a brave Greek hoplite. Um, that's a, a phalanx soldier who would have carried a shield that weighs about 30 pounds, and he would have been trained with a, sh a spear. Um, Plato wrote about him being a brave soldier, and others did as well. Uh, Xenophon, he's a philosopher that we know a lot about of Socrates through he was a amazing military leader, um, leading 10,000 mercenaries into the Peloponnesian War. And uh, you can read about that in his book, Anabasis. Um, Nietzsche, he was a Prussian artilleryman. Marcus Aurelius, a warrior emperor who died on campaign. Sun Tzu, an ancient Chinese general who gave us 
The Art of War. Uh, Miyamoto Musashi, a Ronin samurai who wrote the Book of Five Rings before he died. Uh, Napoleon, while not a philosopher, was greatly influenced by Rousseau and uh, 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 Voltaire and developed a system of military maxims that is one of the most studied uh, systems in the military in the world today. So, and Alexander the Great, tutored by Aristotle. We can't forget these things. It's part of the military. We wouldn't have a, a, a powerful military like the United States without philosophy. And the list just goes on. So, I believe that the mind can be trained insofar as it can become indifferent to the harsh demands of war and that through meaningful dialogue, philosophers can teach the practice of Stoicism to help overcome combat stress and PTSD. All right, Stoicism, what is it? It is a Hellenistic philosophy, which basically is the, uh, an error after the death of Alexander the Great and Aristotle. Uh, that would be around the year 300 before the Common Era. And we have three major philosophies to arrive out of the Hellenistic era. You have Stoicism, Cynicism, and Epicureanism. Um, the first two, Stoicism and Cynicism, are St Socratic philosophies. Uh, I prefer them. They're not as uh, hedonistic as um, Epicureanism, which basically is the pleasure is the only good. Um, Stoicism is divided into three parts academically. We have early Stoicism, which is 300 before the Common Era to about 200. We have middle Stoicism, about 200 to 150 before the Common Era. And then we have Roman Stoicism, which is 150 to uh, about 200 AD. Um, so Stoicism is a Socratic philosophy, and most people in this room definitely know who Socrates was. But for those who do not know who Socrates was, uh, he was, one of, in my opinion, one of the greatest philosophers that ever existed. He um, was known as the Gadfly of Athens. A gadfly, something like a horsefly, would have stung uh, cows into provocation, to, into action. And what Socrates did, after someone told him that they went to the Oracle of Delphi and said that Socrates is the wisest person in Athens, he refuted that. He went there to the Oracle and then uh, asked the same question, who is the wisest person in Athens, and was told the same thing, it's you. So he didn't want that, he didn't believe it. So he made it his mission to find the wisest person in Athens. And he did this by uh, questioning anyone that he would talk to him. He would um, not discriminate anybody, including politicians, which was terrible because they ended up uh, working against him. Um, they uh, didn't like his elenctic style questioning, which was a sort of cross-examination, and it brought out contradictions in people's views. So it made everyone look stupid, essentially. And uh, they put him to death for it. And while he was given opportunities to escape, he said, no, he's gonna you know, stick to his guns. They, they, the court told him he can live if he just refutes the things that he was teaching. He didn't believe in that. He believed in what he was teaching, and so he stuck to his guns and he drank the hemlock and died. Um, today, I'm the gadfly of Rutland. <laughs> Watch that. <laughs> <laughs> so there are three major Socratic ideas in Stoicism. And the first one is, it's not things that upset us, but it's our opinions of those things. In other words, you are upsetting you. Um, things in, or events in and of themselves are indifferent. They have no mean to care. They don't care. It's, it's, it's not a rational mind. It's you that have your reaction to these events that causes the problem. A lot of people hate thinking like that. They don't want to hear it. And uh, in my opinion, it's too bad. Um, the last one, or, or the next one, is model the behavior of wise men. And it goes without saying, uh, keep in mind those who have lived the path of virtue before you. Um, find a, a wise role model. Always look up to someone who, who, who had the right ideas. Someone benevolent, someone virtuous, things like that. Um, and then finally, the unexamined life is not worth living. That one deserves a little bit of explaining. It means you should continually have mindful reflections. Uh, it could be at the end of your day, um, you think about your uh, re interactions with people that you encountered. If you didn't like how something went, well, think about it. How can you change it and make it better for next time? 
you, you can't just go through life all lollygagging and, and just not thinking about what you're doing. Um, you should be able to take great constructive criticism of your own self, your personality. If someone says you're wrong, don't just shut them down. Listen to them. Go into the minds of the people that are, are saying these things and try to look at their perspective instead of closing them off and becoming dogmatic. Dogmatism, I think, is the killer of critical thinking. And uh, we can't really grow if we're not critically thinking. Uh, and then I take an objective view of events. See things as they are without impose, imposing strong value judgments upon them. Uh, remember, things in and of themselves are indifferent. So if someone dies that's very close to you, and you might think, this is horrible. What am I going to do? There's an opportunity in that. Everything that happens to you, there's an opportunity. And it's your job to look for it. Because no one else is going to hand that to you. Uh, Stoicism is a philosophy that embraces impermanence. I love this. Um, so, one of the main ideas in Stoicism came from Heraclitus, a pre-Socratic philosopher, and it's this idea of universal flux. Everything in the universe is in a constant state of change. Um, Heraclitus is the one who said, you never step into the same river twice. That river is moving. And with it are grains of sand being picked up from one place to another. The same molecule that touched your foot when you walked in it is no longer there. Everything in life is like that. Your beauty, your, your looks, it's going to go away as you get older. Some of you might be feeling that now. Um, <clears throat> your favorite glass, I collect uh, brewery glasses. If it breaks, some people will get really upset about that. It's like, oh, how am I going to get another one? Their whole day is ruined permanence. It, you're going to lose it eventually. What happens to that glass when you die? You don't take these things with you after you pass on to the next world. So uh, Stoicism uh, embraces the stark reality of life. And I think that's something warriors, combat veterans can understand because you've seen the stark reality of life. Um, and you must come to terms with your lot, no matter what, even if it's tragic. Uh, that's a quote from Guy Sayer, a German soldier who fought on the Eastern Front and wrote a book called The Forgotten Soldier. It's really good. I, I recommend reading that. Um, Stoicism is a philosophy of mental and physical resilience. Uh, the Stoics admired Sparta and the Spartan way of life. Um, and they actually uh, trained themselves in, in the Greek way of training, which was agoge. Agoge for the Spartans would have been at 12 years old, you would have been taken from your family and put into this rigorous routine of training. You would have been sleeping on straw mats on the hard concrete ground. You would have been given a walking cane or maybe had to make your own. Uh, you would be wearing a cloak that covered one or both of your shoulders. Barefoot, you were subjected to ritual beatings to prepare you for war. Um, in the modern world, there's an ancient uh, exercise that still exists today called San Shin. It's uh, Chinese. Sanzian in Chinese. Um, it's, it's called the Three Conflicts. And it, it's a, essentially a kata that you practice, and your sensei will at certain times punch and kick you repeatedly in different parts of your body to make sure you're, you're, you're tensed up. My father practiced it. My mom knows exactly what's going on there. Um, the object was to not be moved by the thrusts. So it really prepares your body for combat. And that's how the Spartans would have lived, and that's how early Stoics would have lived. Um, the Stoics believed, Epictetus particularly, and I'll probably talk about him in a little bit, believed that uh, there was nothing in this life that we weren't fit to endure. You could um, get sick, and you could take it, or you could go about it whining. Do you have to whine over this? You break your foot, so you have to complain, or you just live? It's a, it's a problem with your foot, but it's not a problem with your mind. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about Mosonius Rufus. Uh, he's a, a Roman Stoic who taught Epictetus. Um, he believed in things like you shouldn't wear too much clothes in the winter. You should keep your body exposed to these elements because nature being uh, one of the main things that Stoicism follows is hard. Nature's tough, so you should be tough like nature. Don't um, spend too much time in the summer in the shade. Sit out in the sun. Sort of these aesthetic ideas uh, of, of hardship that the Stoics would have been practicing. Uh, then I want to talk about James Stockdale. Does anyone know who that is? 
press press. I think he did, uh, maybe in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, he was one of the highest ranking men. He was Ross Perot's brother. Was he? Okay. I'm not too familiar with the politics of that. But. So he was the highest ranking person to have been captured during the Vietnam War. He was shot down in 1965, and as he ejected, this man was a philosopher who practiced Stoicism, by the way. Uh, as he ejected on his way down, he said to himself, at least five years down there, here I am, out of the world of technology, and now into the world of Epictetus. When he landed, he was beaten savagely by a group of about 15 uh, Vietnamese villagers, and that lasted maybe three minutes until he was captured by the North Vietnamese Army and hogtied. Uh, they beat one of his legs so bad he never recovered. His back was broken. Um, during his eight years of imprisonment at the Hanoi Hilton, he spent four of them in solitary confinement, Two of those years in iron leg irons, he, so that he couldn't move his legs, and was uh, subjected to routine tortures. Um, he credits the doctrines of Epictetus with keeping his mind in a good place during that eight-year uh, imprisonment. He, as the rank, highest-ranking leader in prison, stayed um, in tune with his duties. He did not. Uh, he did not lose sense of the fact that he was still at war. He, he knew that, and so he staged uh, rebellions within prison. He had a system of knocking, that he knocked down walls to communicate with other prisoners to keep them in line, made sure everyone was doing okay. There was one instance, this is how hard the Stoics are. He heard that they were gonna parade the prisoners around in town to show the uh, news agencies that they're not abusing the prisoners and uh, when he heard that, he took a broken chair and bashed his face until it was unrecognizable. That way he won up the enemy. He never looked them right in the eye. He always looked up to the side, so he th they thought he was cockeyed. They demanded that you look them in the eye, or otherwise they would beat you, but he didn't want to do that. He stuck to his guns. He remembered the doctrines of Epictetus. Stoicism is a philosophy of virtue, virtue being the only real good. Uh, vice for, for the Stoics is not being virtuous. These are the only two good and evils in Stoicism. And there are four big virtues. Um, all these would have been practiced simultaneously, but I believe the first one, wisdom, is the key. Just like the, the first uh, step in the Eightfold Path, the right view. You can't have the other ones without the right view. So you can't have morality, moderation, and courage without having the right wisdom. So uh, I, I really believe in those four virtues, and particularly wisdom. Um, Stoic has a threefold system of ethics. Stoicism has a threefold system of ethics. The first part regarding the self. You should live at one with your true nature, have a natural self-love, no inner conflict. The second is regarding others. You would live harmoniously with others by viewing ourselves as a part of a single community. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. The third is how you regard events. You live at one with external events by accepting the fate that befalls us. No complaints, no fears, no desires for more. Uh, this is called amor fati, love of fate. Uh, a lot of vets, especially after combat, tend to isolate themselves when they get home. They cut themselves off from other people in the community. Um, I have a lot of buddies that I, I have no idea how to even contact them. I was very close with them. I don't even know where they are. Some of them went through uh, one in particular I was talking about it before uh, everyone got here, um, he got hit by a mortar round during the first week of Haditha, and that mortar hit, I think, six other people, some of them severely. No one died, but guys lost limbs, and, and he, he was blown up all on the, the right side of his arm, and uh, he didn't recover mentally from that, and decided he couldn't go back to the front, and took a mental leave. Um, Every one of my friends, this guy was in my close circle. We called ourselves El Cinco Diablos. We were just a bunch of troublemakers, 18-year-old kids causing trouble. Uh, he was one of us, though. But as soon as that happened and he found out, or he decided he wasn't going to go back to the front, everyone ostracized him. They said he was a POS, that uh, a loser. Like, uh, he was weak because he couldn't do... He couldn't come back to the fight after getting blown up and watching that horrible thing unfold. I saw the mortar strike from the back of a vehicle. I, I don't understand how anyone could uh, hate on him. When we got back from uh, the tour and we landed 
walk down that red carpet. He was the first person at the bottom of the stairs, and everyone ignored him. He cried. I saw it. And uh, that, that hurts me to this day. I don't know how to reach out to him. But if, if people had uh, observed uh, the correct philosophy before this kind of event and, and maybe weren't so aggravated by this, you know, his choice didn't really affect you. You know, we got replacements. We don't need to worry about that. Let him do his thing and get better himself. But vets tend to cut themselves off, you know. Um, and they're, it's, it's not just that. There are guys who... Uh, weren't wounded but saw a lot of stuff and, and they just live in the woods and you never hear from them. Um, they have a hatred for social events or for other people. I've experienced that myself. Getting back, uh, waiting at a red light and then some uh, very clearly a crackhead standing there at the corner scratching um, waits until the light turns green to hop across the road and I'm thinking I want to kill him. I want this man dead. Why? It doesn't make sense. It's not right. Um, it, and it doesn't matter to me, I'm still going to be able to go where I go. So this, this sort of uh, reaction to war was noticed in ancient times by Marcus Aurelius. It was noticed in the Civil War. Um, it's unnatural and it's irrational. These are two stoic ideas about that because, um, I'll get to this, it's something called oikiosis. But uh, as I said, Marcus Aurelius, uh, the, the Roman emperor who fought the northern campaign against the Sarmatian army, which is like an Iranian army, uh, that was encroaching on the Roman Empire at that time, he would have Sarmatian prisoners be brought to him, and uh, they would just execute him right in front of him. And he wrote in his meditations, if you ever see a, a head or an arm that removed from a body, you go into this sort of um, self-reflective thing. You take yourself out of society for a little bit. But it's unnatural to do that because we're social people. There's a danger in this. Um, and that's my next point is uh, the, the oikiosis that Hierocles, the, the middle, middle Stoicism and early Roman Stoic, uh, gave us this idea, developed a type of cosmopolitanism um, <coughs> after, the, after the realization that animals are um, not just aware of themselves, but they're aware of themselves in relation to <coughs> other animals. So Stoicism being a philosophy that's uh, highly driven by the natural way, um, we should realize that our nature is a social and a communal nature. So for veterans, we should realize that 90% of the world does not want to slit our throats at night. It's just not the thing. You go anywhere else in the world, people are just going to live their life. You kind of get this paranoid fear sometimes, or I don't know what it is, but... Uh, it seems like there's always going to be an enemy. I'm always looking around corners. You want to kind of realize that you're home, you're safe. Um, and uh, due to the impermanent and suffering nature of human, li human life, we should consider each other with compassion and that we're in this all together instead of separating yourself from, uh, from society, from your family, from your friends. Um, so this oikiosis, I wish I had a board I could draw this. Um, Heracles described it as a series of concentric circles. The central circle is you and your mind and your thoughts. The next circle is your immediate friends and your immediate family. And the circle after that would be your townspeople. And then the city or the, the state people and then the rest of the world. And the object of this oikiosis or familiar, f familial appropriation is to bring the people in those outer parts of the circles into the way you treat yourself. Love humanity. Uh, so now that we have an idea about stoicism and you know you have a little bit of a flavor of it, and we're, I want to talk about how it's used as therapy. Um, and it's a logic-based therapy. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy was fundamentally stoic. It, it's Epictetus's doctrines to a T. I, I did 16 weeks of it. And while it, it does have a, a, a beneficial effect, I was unhappy with the clinical environment of it and just the clinical nature of, of cognitive behavioral order therapy. Nonetheless, it is effective, but there's a logic-based form of therapy that we could do ourselves. I can't recommend that you, you know, start self-therapy because that could lead to some issues, but this is how it works, and I use examples from my own life. It first, now we don't um, we don't uh, 
realize this consciously, but we create these syllogisms in our brains uh, that are causing these problems. So um, a syllogism is basically an argument with two premises and a conclusion. So for me, my example is a personal one and I'm gonna share. Uh, the first premise would be if I don't react quickly, if one of my vehicles gets hit with an ID and there are casualties, then I'm a bad Marine. Second premise, well, the vehicle got hit. There are massive casualties and I did not react quickly. Therefore, I'm a bad Marine. And so you develop a, a sort of guilt and a self-damnation when you go through this sort of stuff. Uh, now that we have that out of the way, we've figured out the syllogism, we're gonna try to identify the errors in our reasoning of these syllogisms. Um, so you wanna, wanna find the fallacies in it. And I have uh, sheets full of 11 cardinal fallacies that, that we find um, in, in people that are going through trauma. These, these are just uh, errors in our reasoning with uh, things that we've been through that cause a lot of problems for us. Um, in terms of me, my fallacy would have been the self-damnation fallacy. Uh, I, obviously, I'm, I'm damning myself by thinking that I'm a bad Marine because that didn't happen. All right, so what we're gonna do now that we've located that fallacy is we're gonna try to prove that that fallacy is irrational. Um, and by doing that, we're going to look at the, the event that occurred. This can be a trigger. But you have to, like this, I said about Stosin, you're facing these stark realities head on. So I'm going to look at that uh, event that I went through. Um, what happened when, when Doc's vehicle got hit? I was early in the morning. It was hot. I was tired. Falling asleep, people were just trying to keep each other awake in the back of the seven time. All of a sudden, there's an explosion. I'm unconscious. I'm on top of somebody and I'm being helped up. I have tunnel vision. I have limited idea of what's going on, but I could tell that there's a vehicle that was destroyed because there's still stuff falling down from the sky. Um, that's right there is, I've, I've located uh, where I'm being irrational. I suffered a head injury, brain trauma. How could I respond quickly to these people after I've been you know, traumatized? I, I had a TBI. I can't expect to have my body functioning properly and be able to, you know, get there in time to help Doc up. Why should I beat myself up? It's just how it went. The event itself happened, but, you know, I'm okay. Doc's alive. Um, that brain injury is the proof that, you know, that fallacy is in existence. So now that we've got that um, figured out, we can try to find a virtue that will um, counter that fallacy. So self-damnation is what my fallacy is. The virtue that counters that is self-respect. All right, the next step. Um, I need to find a philosophy that's gonna promote self-respect. And after I do that, I believe, well, first of all, I believe Stoicism is the philosophy and Buddhism as well. I'd like to talk a lot about Buddhism some other time. Um, now that I, find, I found the philosophy that's gonna do it, I need to create a plan to practice that philosophy. And uh, write a five paragraph order if you need to. Um, I don't know if anyone here knows what a five paragraph order is. No, um, so, uh, 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 do they have those in the army? But, so Marine, <laughs> Marine squad leaders write what's called a five paragraph order before every mission. They go, there's an acronym, BAMSIS. B, begin the planning. A, arrange the reconnaissance. B, uh, make reconnaissance, or I'm sorry. B, begin the planning. A, arrange reconnaissance. B, make reconnaissance. C, complete the plan. I, issue orders. S, supervise. So you can go down that, that acronym and, and figure out a way to work out you know, your healing process. Begin the planning. Okay, I need to call a library and see who's got books on this and that, or I'll call a professor or, or college and, and see if I can get help somewhere. Um, I'll arrange reconnaissance. I actually do call the library. I do all these things. Um, make reconnaissance. I, 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 we, go, we go down the list. You can, you can use that to motivate you if you needed to. Um, but ultimately, you just need to practice and become disciplined. Uh, 
philosophy, practical philosophy, is militaristic in its nature in the way you need to become disciplined to do it. You, you're, you're not going to have it do anything for you if you're not disciplined about it. Um, so I believe my personal experience with the practice of philosophy has changed my life. Um, albeit it's been uh, a long road and only recently have I seen major changes. Um, it, it, it works. It really does. And I wish I could teach classes on this because this is really just uh, your foot in the door, sort of. You get a taste about what it's about and then after the day, you're on your own, you know? So it's up to you to make the most of your life, ask questions, and don't be afraid to get help. We're in this together. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Hey, luckily it's a small group. We Everybody gets to talk during the discussion, so. <laughs> Any questions? So here's my first question. Yeah. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> you talked about both your own adjustments coming back and friends, and other movies who didn't quite do very well, and it's been very, it's been very heavily publicized and is sort of well known about. <clears throat> difficulties that soldiers have had in fitting back into society after these deployments, particularly in Afghanistan and Iraq, right? My father was part of the, you know, World War II G.I. Joe generation. I mean, he was, I think he was just very typical. I know he saw terrible, horrible things. His ship was hit by kamikazes, he <clears throat> saw men burned to death, he saw the, only towards the end of his life when he was actually dying did he talk about some of the atrocities that were committed by some of the soldiers on the ship. But, they, you know, after the war, he sailed back from Japan and he came down to gang plank and they signed up for the GI Bill and got a you know a mortgage for a house in the suburbs and he and like it seemed like most of those guys and it was almost all guys that they just like went about their lives and if they had this internal you know if they had these haunting memories they seemed to have done a a real good job of suppressing them. What do you think was, was, what do you think was different about the experience of being in Iraq or Afghanistan, or do you think it was? The, how do you account for the difference? That's a good question. It's actually a very difficult question. Yeah, that's I, why I asked it. I've tried not to compare uh, <coughs> us with the guys that fought in the Second World War. Mm -hmm different wars entirely, but at the same time, you go through some of the same stuff. Yeah. Um, there was also not as many distractions in that day that I think people um, they get lost in these days, like scrolling on Facebook, your whole day spent doing this or that. Those guys had great work ethic. It truly was one of the most great generations to live. Um, I, I don't want to say that they you know, did a great job. A lot of these guys struggled their whole lives. They suppress it. They didn't talk about it. And right. I mean, what would have happened if you asked questions to your father? Would he, would he have shut you up or would he have talked to you about it? When I was growing up and we asked my father what he did in the war or what it was like to be in the war, he would always deflect them and talk about, like, you know, how short a shower they were allowed or what the food was like. He never talked, when we were growing up, he never talked about what it was like, you know, to be on a cruiser and have Japanese planes, you know, strafe the, the, the ship and, you know, seeing somebody next to him shot, which he did talk about when he was 91 years old, right? Um, I don't know, you know, like he came back and 
and he couldn't live in his parents' basement. You know, they lived in an apartment, right? Like nobody did that. And, and yeah, there wasn't Facebook and there wasn't these distractions, but I just wanted to know if you're, you know, I'm sure you thought about it. I have. Um, I, I think there, a lot of suppression was going on. And I mean, behind it all, there was a, probably a lot of hurt. Last night, for example, I was up all night and I was thinking about the stuff I was talking about with these syllogisms. Uh -huh. It was making me shake. And it, it, something about revisiting it is very, very difficult. So they concentrate on something else. They had the right attitude to focus and make a family and create a home and do what's good for them. Uh, today, I, I don't see a lot. I do, but you know, I, I wonder if, because I've never looked at the st statistics for guys uh, committing suicide after World War II and stuff yeah. like that. But I know in Vietnam it was a big problem. Yes. So, <coughs> I, you know, I can't speak too much about the Do you think maybe it had to do with the moral clarity of the war? That could be a big thing. Yeah, sure. They thought it was the Great War. It was a, a one that had to be fought. Well, I mean, for example, when I don't mean to dominate the discussion, but we have time. Um, you spent a couple of years in Iraq, right? I spent a total of 14 months. Yeah, or, or a couple of tours. Uh, it's long enough, right? Do you think it was worth our country being there? Uh, honestly, I've never gotten to the bottom of why we were there in the first place. A real good answer? Yeah. There hasn't been one presented to me. It's all uh, unclear. Um, I mean, th there's things that they, they put on the face of it, you know, like we were fighting terrorism. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know, it was sort of a ghost enemy. And when you got them, they, they would somehow disappear you just find blood. Like, we don't know even who we're fighting. Um, guys that were in Iraq a little bit before I was, uh, there was a lot more of an organization in, uh, in terms of the enemy. Uh, for me, I mean, lots of IEDs. If you found something on the ground, you couldn't even pick it up, it'd blow up. It's just, every step was fearful. It, it was constant. Pressure plates. Uh, I, I walked into a house and uh, a booby trap went off and it didn't blow up. It just scared the shit out of everybody. Yeah. So it, it's just a constant sort of on edgeness. Um, so well, maybe that accounts for the difference in the veterans experience you know my when my father and his contemporaries you know went you know got on ships in the Pacific it was very clear you know like why they were there that they didn't have like a whole it, it wasn't a morally complicated right war you know the country maybe for the Germans it was hmm? <laughs> maybe for the Germans. Yeah. A lot of the Germans didn't, uh, go, they weren't Nazis per se, they were just told that they're fighting for the fatherland. <laughs> wasn't until the end where they... No, I'm they, talking about for, for U.S. soldiers. Right, right, right. yeah. For all males. Right, I don't want to dominate the discussion. What's up? Uh, we think a lot of vets struggle with kind of the idea that they're told to suppress a lot of it but the need to vent it out, maybe is that causing a lot of the turmoil internally where they, they feel this inner need to get what they saw and need to vent it, but also are trained to kind of retain it and deal with it. Because I know you've talked a lot about, like you said, it, you brought up a lot of the things when you were over there, you were told to shut up, you were told to be quiet, you were told to deal with it. Do you think that's a problem for a lot of vets today? And what would solution there's this uh, <clears throat> sort of I, I hesitate but I'll call it pseudo masculine type attitude where you just have to portray the, the, the hardened warrior and uh, you have these emotions but there's nothing inside you saying that you need to get something out it's just there's something there that you don't know what it is and and it's like I was telling you earlier um, in garrison, coming back from, from the war, you might see veterans out there drinking on the weekends. You always have the new guys that haven't gone yet, and then the tough, you know, older generations that have, have been there. And you'll see them drinking, and a lot of times crying and fighting, talking about they miss their friends. They don't know how to deal with it. And they, so it comes out in anger and, and, and violence. And that is reflected in relationships. That's reflected in, in, in all sorts of things in their lives. Uh, early on, after I got out, it was reflected in mine too. 
would you say there's a stigma with veterans about reaching out, talking about your feelings? Mm -hmm. Yep. <coughs> yes. So, Jeremy, your great talk. Thanks. This is wonderful. Well delivered. Um, now, you're studying uh, Stoicism in comparison with Buddhism. Yes. Now, um, <coughs> and uh, Japanese Zen Buddhism uh, particularly has uh, close parallels with Stoicism, particularly when thinking about uh, warriors and the role <coughs> of them. Uh, and within Zen, uh, meditation is sort of, the Zazen is a you know, central practice, uh, not only for warriors, but for um, uh, those who are looking to pursue philosophy as a way of life. Uh, do we find anything in Stoicism comparable to that of, say, meditation in Zen, or even meditation in general in Buddhism? Uh, I don't know how comparable it is, because in, in Buddhism, it's like, really, you're sitting there in the right posture, and you're, you're taught, the, you know, how to position your body, how to breathe right, and the Stoics didn't really concentrate too much on that as much as the reflection and, and mindfulness of things that are going on. Um, if I do encounter anything that's very similar about that, I, I'll definitely let you know. But I, I, I don't see like a Buddhist style meditation in Stoicism. You sound like you have a really, very sound, like wonderful like therapy deal with some of these traumatized you know, uh, young men and women coming back from these areas. I mean, the challenging question is how would you be able to develop the skills you know, to be able to like, communicate some of these ideas that you have to be really you know, incredible forms of therapy for them? I probably need to go to school for it. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, these guys, they're they a wall around them. Mm -hmm. right? And you, you have contact with them. You know, some of them right? Yeah, uh, the <laughs> therapy is psychology of it is almost uncharted for me because it's only philosophic in my mind and uh, I don't exactly right now know the tools to uh, open those doors for these guys but I think stuff like this could work if I can go around talking at VFW after VFW and get larger crowds someone has got to be influenced I think I hope something that I've gotten involved in, but I can see parallels. Oh, That's absolutely. That's beneficial, That's definitely. Uh, this guy here, I've been in two or three of his courses. Um, Bob Johnson, I've gone through several of his courses. In fact, is the first, um, my first semester at Castleton, I saw logic. 
mathematical logic and uh, integrated circuits and stuff like this in the Air Force. And I saw logic and I thought, well, that's not be for me. So I discovered immediately what I got in there that the logic he was teaching and the logic that I had been teaching were a bit different. You could say. Um, I think it would be worthwhile on a Thursday night or any time. Should I talk to Victoria and, okay, I know, I know where her office is. Uh, actually, Frank's office is right next to Victoria's. Oh, that works then. And actually, he's in the office that Victoria was in when I showed up at Castleton in 1990. I want to make sure that you talk with Morgana, too, and Frank before we talk with Richard. With Richard I'm so. from the White River Vet Center. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that was a connection that I wanted to, you know. But we know and love what you're doing. And we can see the burning, you know, a vision to bring a sort of healing philosophy to a community that's in need. And I would love to see this uh, um, combination of forces, a synergy, right? That uh, is able to provide a platform and maybe some training, like as you're suggesting, and uh, maybe bring the message. Pardon me. Yes. Uh, so kind of piggybacking off of that, do you think it would be beneficial maybe as a preventative measure? I know that while you're over there, um, they make you do studies. Do you think it would be more approachable for the active duty soldiers to learn about stoicism as, like I said, maybe a preventative measure to help as a coping mechanism and maybe avoid this whole stigma of like therapy or talking about feelings, maybe educating them? in terms of Stoicism, Buddhism, ways of coping, it's and a, dealing with it before trauma happens. I think that's a, a important thing to be doing. I said it before, if I had known prior, I wouldn't have done some of the war crimes I myself had committed. So, Not knowing how to deal with that. Yeah, I, you know, I would have had a better head on my shoulder and been less irrational if I was exposed to it. But they, they don't... There's no real room, like, for an infantryman during wartime, you're so busy, and you, I, I have a, I don't see the military sort of implementing that, but or I... Or even allowing access to study materials so, that could give soldiers an outlet, ones that are actively looking for something without the stigma of seeking help or therapy, you know, for fear of being ostracized or... There's a, there's a guy that, that does this already, and it's not stoicism, it's, it's uh, psychological. His name is Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman. And he, so in today's world, uh, modern warriors are um, briefed at least once before they deploy on the idea that they're probably gonna experience things that are gonna traumatize them. 90% uh, of people that experience combat for three months consecutively have combat stress, 90%. Um, there's a, a very small percentage that, that don't, and that's, that's like, 2% uh, are actually predisposed psychopathic. Um, that, that's the statistic. Uh, but um, this David Grossman was, uh, he was he served, he was a combat veteran, and uh, he kind of prevents these really or presents these really motivating speeches that gets Marines and soldiers ready to go, wild up. Like he wrote books called uh, "One on Killing: The Psychological Effect of Killing," and that goes over, you know, uh, all sorts of killing, uh, from mafia hits to like 
um, mercenary kills in Africa to street gangs and, and real personal um, uh, scenarios that he goes over and uh, how it affects the people. And there are statistics in those books. And then on combat, the psychological effects of, of combat, uh, it's only combat. It's not like the gang killings and stuff like that. So he wrote these books, and, and he comes and presents on them for the service members before they go. Uh, his son's uh, a, a Navy SEAL, I think is a Navy SEAL, or, or Green Beret. And so he, he, he's got like a lot of pull with the, with, with the service, but it's not a philosophical type of, of healing. It's, it's more of a like, yeah, we're going to do this. Oh, we're, gonna, we're definitely going to kill people. You know, These young soldiers and Marines are, are really amped to do that. Um, and that's, I think, what the government wants for them to be willing to kill for the nation. You mentioned the, uh, the, the social, the sociality of our species, like Stoics will look at these other, you know, social animals, we're animals, let's learn from nature and identify ourselves as inherently directed, not just on the world as a world of things, but there are people, right, to whom we look and identify, you know, when I see someone's eyes and make the contact and, you know, there's a certain kind of maybe respect that we might think is uh, a part of a virtuous sort of interaction with other other beings with whom we can identify uh, as persons. <clears throat> if that's part of the stoic conception of what we are, uh, I wonder how you might suggest like a change or a uh, like a, an alteration of the message that you were just describing what would be stoic medicine for soldiers who are receiving a pep talk of the sort that you know you just cast in a little bit of a critical light in light of our sociality like what would be an appropriate stoic message at that time so you're saying you're going there's going to be killing this is war and we're social beings. When I look into the, you know, identify, it's not just a thing, right? When some, someone falls, you know, uh, and I'm on the other side of the, the instrument of death, then the, I guess one of the points is that that's, a, that can, that's traumatizing. And I guess Stoics, it sounds like they may have an, at least a basic analysis of well, why would that be traumatizing? <laughs> right when Marcus Aurelius sees somebody lose a head, he identifies that that, you know, you can almost feel it. Right? Isn't that part of what you were suggesting? You can you have a visceral reaction. So I feel it in my body as the being, but there's also an identification with the other in that act. So when I, you know, it sounds it sounds cliche, but and hurting them, I hurt me or something like that. So Marcus didn't uh, really like that sort of thing. Right. But in his situation, um, where the empire was being encroached upon, he had no choice but to go fight a war. He did have a choice whether or not these prisoners were going to be executed in front of him, mm -hmm. or whether or not someone should be tortured. Um, it was also a time that death was all over. There were plagues, um, they were wiping out villages, there was scented wood being burned around town to cover the smells, and out of his 13 children, two survived. Mm -hmm. So this, this idea of impermanence and death and, and loss, it, it just goes with the name of the game for them. There was almost a moral right to fight that war, whereas mm -hmm. in today's world we don't really see that with what the U.S. is doing. Either. Right. So I don't really know. Yeah, there's the moral clarity point about self-defense or something. Is there's it, a relevance. Does a practicing stoic ever have the, <coughs> the idea like a change of thought that kill, another human being is wrong? Uh, <coughs> is it? Well, it, it would be part of the morality. Should uh, try always to. The practicing Stoic would not argue. They don't want conflict. They really don't. I, I imagine a Stoic sage, like a Buddhist sage, um, just peaceful, uh, here and now, focused, um, and, and nonviolent. But sometimes uh, violence occurs in, in this world, and I think Stoicism is a philosophy that really helps deal with that. Just like. Uh, uh, the Japanese train their their soldiers to fight in this sort of Bushido idea. They have these these great peaceful philosophies that you can sort of kink into uh, a, a warrior tool. So I think that 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 happens with Stoicism too.
stoicism is a lot about, <coughs> like in <coughs> for you know people like Marcus like Aurelius, <coughs> it was a lot about duty and responsibility, and and <coughs> and, and if the you know the Senate or you know the emperor said go attack you know this this barbarian ability and, and kill everybody. Well, that was your duty. In ancient times, there was something called the Stoic Opposition, when there was a group of Roman emperors for a period of time that uh, were like Nero, who was killing his family members, and, and they were just so corrupt, the Stoics had a more obligation to object. And so what the emperor started doing was exiling these philosophers and getting them out of there because they were causing problems in the Senate and they were causing problems in, in, in uh, the politician lives. So the Stoics, they, they, they would object to that needless, in, immoral activity. Did you ever see the film, uh, uh, the old film Apocalypse Now? Yeah. <laughs> was he uh, Stoic? Uh, Marlon Brando, I think, Kurt something, I think it was Stoic. Was he a Stoic? I'm going to go back and see that now in the light of... Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll have to, yeah. to we, we watched Major Pain last night, and the, <laughs> the, the beginning of it is sort of a parody of the beginning of Apocalypse Now, where he's doing the yoga and all that, and I was just like, oh my god, um, but I, I'd, I'd have to revisit it, because I can't answer well, that right remember, now. It sounds like uh, he was heavily influenced by it. Maybe. I'll go back and look at that myself. Me too. <clears throat> all I can think about is the, the end, when the bowl is getting decapitated and they're actually cutting the guy's head off and the, the end by the doors is playing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, Jeremy, just to kind of piggyback on what you guys are talking about, do you think that there's time for stoicism when we're preparing to go into combat? I think it would be helpful for the crowd to kind of get a realization of when you're preparing to go to combat, you're not thinking about those kind of things. You're thinking about your mission. You're thinking about coming home. You're thinking about your there's time. I had time. Yeah. I brought my meditations with me, both departments. Um, there's always going to be downtime when you're over there, and I spent it reading. Um, but you were by yourself reading. You weren't with your group. I could have been, though. Yeah, that's the, the important the, part. There's definitely uh, opportunities. Y you'd have to do it on your downtime instead of you know <coughs> writing a letter. You can get a group and, and talk about it. Because the military is not going to teach it to you. It's something that you're going to have to do yourself, I think, in the end. Well, you had a little knowledge of it before. You didn't just get there sort of in the book. Right. I, I did. My, my father showed me a, a little bit about it. But really, I mean, after years and years of reading the same uh, book, The Meditations, I, I realized I didn't quite understand it because I didn't read Epictetus, who basically is you know where Marcus Aurelius got a lot of his philosophy from. So I had to look at everything else on the side and then go back to the meditations and be like, oh my god, this is awesome. So it's good in and of itself, but you should, to get a good grasp, you need to read other stuff. You had a question? Oh, you after him. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to ask, how come the military doesn't teach you folks this? And is this similar in other militaries of other countries too? Or not? Um, why doesn't the military teach us this? Well, they're busy teaching you uh, everything to get ready for battle. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. Um, uh, weeks at a time, you'll, you might be in the jungle uh, getting helicopter dropped from here to there. And, and, and in your spare time, you're, uh, you're reading, um, during your training, you're reading, you know, how far does my weapon fire? How far does the enemy's weapon fire? What's the, you know, little nomenclatures about this and that or... Uh, how to call in a nine line on the radio when uh, someone hits an IED or when someone gets hit by a sniper. There's all kinds of stuff that you need to focus on. So much that it, uh, ultimately, like you, you really need to search for the time to do this. And it's like late at night, when right before bed, you might have a few minutes to read, but they really fill up your time. The second you wake up, uh, you have exactly like 20 minutes to sh shower, shave, and get outside and you're green on green and go for a run, come back, um, you know, go to lunch or, or go to breakfast, and then everything is scheduled it's by the second, almost. So uh, they, won't, they won't put it in, in the 
discussion with teach survival tech survival. Yeah, in terms of other militaries, it <coughs> might stuff like this might happen in, in uh, some Asian militaries. Um, I know they teach martial arts in, in some of them, uh, like the Koreans and, th and Thai military. They spend um, a lot of time with it in Israel. In Israel? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They have a whole doctrine called Tahor Han Haneshek, meaning the purity of arms. It's a does it always work? No, right? Um, no, but they, but they put a lot of effort into it. That's good. Um, I, I advocate for stuff like that. Um, there is a reading list that the Marine Corps has. The Commandant recommends all these books, um, and the Meditations is one of them. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot. The Art of War, Sun Tzu, that's, that's one. Um, I mentioned The Forgotten Soldier, that's another one. There's a, a lot of... Uh, I think the Gallic Wars by Caesar might be a high-ranking officer's book to read. A lot, a lot of uh, stuff. You, you gotta, you have to really look for it though. Um, they're always trying to make you do some kind of like MCI kind of like le leadership for Marines or something like that. And they take up all, all the time you have. There's no freedom. Everything's mission first. Mission's first is the number one thing. No matter what they do, you're trained. Anything that you learn, anything you do, is mission first. So anything extra is your downtime. That's how you kind of do what you need to do in that way. Well, they, they, they really don't want you to fail. They don't want you to react. Yeah. I mean, they're not going to. You start studying philosophy, you can start asking questions, yeah. <laughs> and that's the last thing I would imagine. I'm not, I don't mean in the military. But that'd be the last thing that. <laughs> Too much thinking paralyzes. <laughs> We've seen it happen to good kids. <laughs> It's true. Yeah. I mean, you can't be a philosopher without asking why. That's the big one. You had a question. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, one of the things I keep, I relate back to some of the things that I used to teach were like binary extremes. And uh, in your case, when you're in the Marine Corps, I think ultimately, like, in the heat of it, there's only one extreme. Yes. I can't remember a time that you know I was really in a dire strait and I didn't have tunnel vision. Um, almost every conflict that uh, I was near death, um, or at least that I was aware I was near death, I was completely out of my mind, like screaming top of my lungs, f shooting every which direction. Uh, and not not being stoic, just trying to live. Yeah. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't really, a, I wouldn't have to say I was a stoic when I was in, because it was just something I, I was into. I liked to read. And I got into it really heavily afterwards, which I think uh, well, I mean, was, was a good move, but <clears throat> I don't know how much benefit I'm gonna get thinking back on what if I did this back then, but I could look at the idea of people who are in that situation now and how we could observe the changes if they were focused on this at that time. You know. Do you think there are many uh, other uh, like vets in, in America that uh, have practiced or are interested in uh, the stoicism? Mm. <coughs> uh, it would be an interesting thing if there was like a lot of different people who got together and <coughs> tracking or start building from that, maybe. I've 
recently started to look into that. There's one veteran that's uh, really into ethics now. He got back from Iraq and it's just all about ethics. I, I, I like ethics. That was one of the big things about <coughs> philosophy that got me rolling. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if there's many like you know active Stoics, Stoic veterans. There's books written on it. One by Nancy Sherman called Stoic Warriors, which is a favorite of mine. Um, I would recommend reading that if you're interested in it. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm definitely like I, I'm I'm on that path. I, I'm looking for people who are interested in it to to build discussions. There's uh, something called Stoicon. It happens, I think, in Toronto every year. Hmm. They have these all the Stoics in the world <laughs> go, go to this one spot. <laughs> they have these little conferences. Um, it's it's a philosophy that's really gaining popularity. It, it's right. uh, where's that take place? Toronto? Toronto? Yeah. I'm not sure if it's every year in Toronto, but I know uh, the guy that, that's doing all the work, um, uh, Donald Robertson, uh, is you know, there now. So. Hmm. so. Uh, since you just said that stoicism is gaining in popularity, so I, I was just curious, was there, like, was it like a year for a long time? Kind of popular in different places at different times. Um, it's obscure or has been uh, misunderstood for many years, and, and many people just have a, a conception of a perception of, of stoicism as like a, these uh, emotionless, very austere people who um, uh, are sort of. Know, you think of stoic warriors like just a tough, like machines that that, that don't feel. They observe their emotions with their uh, rational mind, the directing mind, as Marcus Aurelius calls it. Uh, and they understand that emotions are natural parts of human life. Um, that's something we're going to deal with. You're going to feel angry. You're going to feel sad. But it's your job as a rational being to uh, observe how, how, uh, whether or not you're going overboard. So this temperance, this prudence, one of the main uh, virtues in Stoicism must be practiced. Uh, so if you feel anger, stop and think about why you're angry. Is this outside event that's not relevant to your life bother you? Can you just move on and, and not think about it? Uh, how are you looking at it that's affecting why you're acting like that? When you look at, when you're angry, you, you look like a beast. And Seneca would have said that uh, you're less than a beast. When you're angry, your lips quivering, your eyes all red, veins popping out. It's no good. It's not good for your health, and it's not good for the people around you. Um, and, and you're doing yourself an injustice. And the same, you can take any emotion uh, and, and, and think of two parallels. Almost like Aristotle's uh, a virtue system, where there's a, a, a mean you want to find, and, and you want to avoid the extremes. So, so it's looking like Surprisingly, I do have a question for you. <laughs> With the stoicism, do you think it would be more beneficial for the actual soldier to learn this and develop it within themselves before and while they're deployed? Or would it be more beneficial for the parents and the siblings while they're deployed to learn about it in order to help them once they do get back. I think both of those are, are, are what beneficial. What do you think is more important? I wouldn't, I wouldn't discriminate between the two. They're both important. I, so I'm here to help veterans because I've experienced it and know it works for me. But this is for everybody. It, 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 and one of the earlier Stoics uh, was one of the first ancient philosophers to, to say that women have equal rights and should be taught uh, philosophy as well. Um, that's Masonius Rufus. So um, it's it's not it's not just a, a warrior's philosophy. It's for you. It's for me. It's for everyone else. So anyone who resonates with it. Basically, I should have used this on my drive up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you it, can you, you can drive back though. It's fine. <laughs> you got it now. It helps in in all all. 
sorts of parts of your life. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it, for, for the servicemen, the veterans that are, that are suffering through some, some major PTSD, as a lot of them we, we personally know are, would it be beneficial for them not realizing that they need this type of help for their, their family members, but to be able to get a group together of parents, of siblings, in order to help that one, that one veteran that, that doesn't understand that they need the help to try to help that, it, you know what I'm saying? I do, but it also sounds like that could uh, be, in, yeah, uh, the individual really needs to take the steps to, to help themselves. <coughs> um, but I mean, what if I died over there? And, and, and imagine that, think about it. But it's, I it's did. A, yeah. I did. So if you knew this philosophy and uh, you were able to practice it and that horrible thing, you know, happened. It wouldn't have mattered. Okay. It wouldn't have changed. It, it could have, it could be a help, I think. I mean, if you, I if you. I the individual and, and, and how they react. Because if something had happened to you worse than what did. I probably would have <coughs> killed myself. I wouldn't have been able to handle <coughs> my child in that type of environment. And it's it's tough stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't have all the answers, but I think it's a good a good starting point for a anyone to to pick themselves <coughs> out of a rut, or to, I mean, if you know it, okay. you could you could just in passing, you know mention something to someone it could you never know like like if you just keep smiling at people you never know how you could change someone's day if you know this kind of philosophy or have an idea about it and you talk about it around people um that that you think might need it you never know it might help them so, so if you were to contact a va and maybe get a group because you have you have so many people that need the mental help together and, and just create a meeting once a month with some of these men and women. I were to do something like that, I really would need training. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've met one gentleman, his name was Sawdust, a Vietnam veteran. His entire platoon was killed, and he hid under a body for three days, and the Vietnamese did dead checks on the bodies. He survived, and I met him at the VFW in Hebron, Connecticut, and, and this guy was not okay. Still, I mean, this was uh, maybe five or six years ago constantly getting into fights with police officers, uh, getting dragged out of the VFW. How do I get through to someone like that? You know, I need training. I, I, I couldn't just go into a group where there's people that have experienced stuff like that and start preaching, you know? Not to preach, but to teach. I probably am doing that now, though, you know? Well. <laughs> you gotta learn the therapy. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> humility, you're recognizing limits of your own capacities. Also, you know, a part of how to a stoic would want to carry herself and self in the world. Mm -hmm. I know Richard had a, another uh, contribution. There. Just to kind of um, contribute to that. So within the VA, Tai Chi is recognized right now. So they're teaching a lot of that. And you can get that through telecognitive work. Jeremy could look at it from that aspect. Something that you're talking about, the Vet Center is another location. <coughs> you know, within the Vietnam, there's circumstances in their conflict circumstances in Jeremy's conflict, mine. So age-wise, there may be different conflicts within the group. So it is better to get the individual 
conflict air groups together that are comfortable about, but they also have that same general knowledge. Yeah. But we also do teleconferencing. It's interactive teleconferencing within the VA. So they don't have to go all the way to White River. They can do it here in Rowan. They can do it in Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. They can have small assemblies at tables, right, within the, each of, we call them CBOX, so the community-based outpatient clinics yep. that are located. One's in Rowan, Brattleboro, Bennington, um, St. Albans, <coughs> Burlington's Lakeside. So they've looked at different things, not only Tai Chi, they've looked at uh, fly fishing. They've mm -hmm. looked at boating. Um, the Vet Center offers a ton of things where Jeremy could get involved with smaller groups to start with, get the word out, and then mm -hmm. kind of build on that as well. Rifles, so, Rifles to Rods is a group that's doing that fishing and, yeah. and, and hunting stuff. And that also seems like it presents more of a safe environment where it's something recreational. Yeah. 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 So there's yeah. the possibility yeah. of sure. talking about this kind of stuff. Go to it. It's free. There's many different things at the Vet Center. You don't have to be a client. Pool it's table. free. We do yeah. have a pool <laughs> table. You can just come on down and shoot pool. It's really not a problem. Um, each Vet Center has something different. I was at the Manchester Vet Center for three years. They have an open air group. So it's a mixture of all airs. You have Vietnam, you have OIF, OND, veterans together. Um, you know, there's many different things. I would love for you to come talk. So usually when they come back, and each service is a little different, but they do demobilization. So they don't come right back to their families right away. They're usually at a, a out processing area and they go through classes and some is a waste and some is there to kind of get the mindset started before they get presented back to their families um, things like this could be huge in that aspect because you could interface it and I'm not sure mom over there as well but you know we're saying teach it to them before they go but that might be the time to teach it to them before they reintegrate with their family members as well mm -hmm. so in respect to that I would think that um, you've got to look at the timing because a lot of times service members got one thing on their mind when they get back, right? They want to go back to their families. Are they ready to go back to their families? Probably not right away, but they think they're ready to go back to their families. <coughs> um, and then a lot of the service members are leaving their camaraderie that they've built with their platoons and their squads, mm -hmm. and they're going back and they're not seeing those same individuals because some of them are reserve status. Some of them are National Guard status. So they don't get the same thing that the active duty members get that are going back to their companies and going back to their permanent duty stations. So I think when you focus on what Jeremy's offering, you've got to know where you can inject it. Yeah. And within the VA, I think that's a good opportunity where um, you make a connection with one of the social workers and you present the idea and then you build on it from there. We have the people we can put you in contact with that kind of stuff as well. So, um, you know, we, we do the same thing here in the VFW. We have a, a monthly meeting. The officers and the trustees are the ones who show up for the meeting. And there's 248 other members in this VFW and you get 10 people at the meeting. So you've gotta get the, the veterans to wanna to partake as well. That's the other hard part. One other thing about Frank, with numerous veterans that come in to council staff, um, multitudes on each day that it happens to be there uh, in Castle for about an hour or sometimes more in addition to the, to the meeting that occurs on Thursday evenings. Um, and there are times even when we come in for a meeting and somebody has uh, either been late coming in, so we may be sitting there the us as a group, and Frank is still counseling somebody in the office. But the, the thing about that is the one-on-one -on -one relationship that he has established. And uh, another thing that was kind of thought about uh, for quite some time at Castleton, uh, I don't know if you remember Chris White, mm. who was the professor in mathematics. He lived right on South Street. Uh, he willed his house and property to the college with the objective of being a veteran support uh, attendant. Uh, of course, uh, nobody has the money to 
renovate it and to actually establish it as a vet center on campus. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is still in people's minds uh, that that might evolve into that. Mm -hmm. So how many people show up like closed loop on Thursday? Well, well it's got it's been diminishing. Okay. And uh, <coughs> is it because of the the, the death rate with the older That's, veterans are leaving, well, or is it because you got winter time? And they go That's south. Part of and uh, I've only been in the group now for about four years. But uh, <coughs> Bob Rummel was the dean of students at Castleton. He was the individual that got me into Castleton. Uh, and Bob Rummel has been known for quite some time around here. He's since disappeared. I'm not sure where. Uh, we also have like. I sense there's a lot of uh, cheerleading going on in this room and also some constructive ideas that have come out. Um, I, 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 we're just getting close to 8.30, so I guess we might ask Jeremy if you, ha if you have any final thought or comment to share, you can't, you know, feel free. It should give you that opportunity and, and I'll just like, you know, say another word or so. But. Um, not so much, but on term you're, you're talking about a possible vet center at Castleton, mm. right? I was up, um, by uh, your wife's office, I think yesterday, I was looking for Babcock Hall. I didn't know where it was. I, I, I never go like past the campus center. And uh, I saw that there was a, a wall that said, it was like a veteran's wall. I never saw it before in my life. There was no flyer for this event on it. So I, st I stood there like this, I was like, oh, it wasn't a flyer. So I, I could become myself more active uh, at Cass and you know, to do this stuff. Everyone seems to know that I do it. I've been in classrooms for the past two semesters talking about it, so. Well, one of the best resources for you is my wife. <coughs> and uh, I can honestly say that I'm still alive because I met her. Mm. Uh, I had some serious things that were going on. Um, both uh, other things that were, and this guy knows about some of them or mm -hmm. rooms. Um, but um, she's kind of a veterans representative on campus. And I think that's simply because I'm kind of still in the picture in that sense. Was it Memorial Plaza? Isn't she with the veterans at the center? She gets up over there. Is that Memorial Plaza? Yeah. yeah. Adri Adrian used to be over there as well. That's <coughs> um, Maggie. Martha Virgin yes, one of our that's, best points of contact. She was the individual who I had, I had her card in here. I was looking for Frank's card. Yeah. And um, next Thursday, I hope to see Martha. I was this is great. Yeah. 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 Well, th hey, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm honored.